I'm speaking with Brian Vandemark, author of Road to Disaster. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for having me on, Chris. So first, can you tell me, um, from the beginning, how did you get into uh, studying and writing the subject of this book? Well, it's a long story, and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I'm 58 years old, so I'm old enough to remember the Vietnam War as a child. Uh, and I grew up during the 1960s and early 1970s. I was too young to be exposed to the draft, but I had friends in my neighborhood who had older brothers who uh, were exposed to the draft. And I was politically conscious at a fairly young age, and I understood even then how powerfully emotional and uh, divisive the Vietnam War was in American society. And as I grew up and went to college and graduate school, uh, I wanted to address uh, questions that the war had posed to me, which is how did we get involved? What were the consequences of that involvement? And I wrote a a doctoral dissertation on the Vietnam War, which led uh, to uh, my moving to Washington to help Clark Clifford uh, as research assistant on his autobiography. Um, Clifford had served as a uh, legal counsel to Truman in the late 40s. He'd been there at the uh, beginning of the Cold War, and he'd also been Secretary of Defense after McNamara in 1968, which was the bloodiest year of the Vietnam War. And then uh, when that project was wrapping up, I uh, accepted a teaching position at the Naval Academy of Annapolis. And shortly thereafter, I embarked on the um, biography of Robert McNamara, and I interviewed him in the course of the research, and after about a year and a half of research, another very uh, detailed and critical biography of Maxwell was published, and he asked me to read it and share my uh, reactions and impressions with him. And I did, and I told him what I thought were evidence and what he wanted to hear, because by then I suspect he was a big man rather than a little one um, who would accept and, in fact, appreciate honesty and uh, criticism from people around him. And I told him, I said, it was a, a, a good effort, and that uh, if he was going to address his responsibility for decision-making in the Vietnam War, based on the record and not wishful recollection, I would help him do that, because that book would be far more important than anything I could write about him. Mm-hmm. He agreed, and we uh, proceeded, and he eventually published the book that people thought he would never write uh, in 1995, after nearly 30 years of uh, silence on the subject. And the reaction to that book was very powerful, very emotional. People on the left and the right just erupted in response to it, and um, I had uh, failed to anticipate that, and I thought that by being candid and accepting responsibility for mistakes, that it would have a healing effect, but instead it uh, agitated people. And I reacted to that by um, essentially uh, um, stopping uh, writing on Vietnam. I didn't think there was anything I could say about him or the war that would be more impactful than what I had helped him do, um, and I had been disturbed by the emotional intensity of the reaction to his book. So uh, he passed away uh, in 2009, and a couple of years after that, I began to think to myself, um, it's about time to go back to that subject. Um, two decades and more have passed since uh, I helped him with this memoir. There's more time um, behind us. I have more perspective on this. I'm older. I have more experience. I think that my ability to approach that subject um, was just more mature and more... Uh, um, more nuanced, and uh, that's why I decided to write the book. I knew that I always probably would, given the fact that I'd worked closely with him and with Clifford, um, and I think that enough years had passed uh, that the time had come for me to um, to go back to that issue and wrestle with this fundamental question that was always in my mind, which is, how could good people make such terribly bad decisions? Um, I knew them, who, uh, and others who were the Albert Sam called the best and the brightest, um, and it just, it was a paradox to me. Uh, how and why good, well intentioned, patriotic, smart people could do such stupid things. Mm-hmm. And this was my effort to, um, to explain that to myself and therefore to readers. So that segues into uh, my next question, which is uh, I'd like to talk about the book itself. Um, I see it's laid out chronologically. Uh, yeah. how, how did you make, I guess that's um, perhaps the, the, most straightforward way to do that, but uh, did you perhaps think about doing it in any other way, or, or, or tell me your thinking about that? Well, as a historian, um, the fundamental framework of most good history is chronological because it enables you to recreate the story as it happened and allows you to look at the chain of cause and effect in a sequential way uh, and re 
telling the story in the way that it was lived. I think in addition to that, it's important to bring the thematic um, uh, pattern to that work so that people understand that it's more than just a bunch of names and dates. It needs to be analytical, it needs to be interpretive, it needs to be explanatory. So if the narrative arc is chronological, you have to go beyond merely telling the story and more importantly, explaining it to readers. And that's what I tried to do in this book. So I see as uh, one of the main themes I saw or th that I read in the description and in, in the, the prologue, the introduction, um, was organizational behavior. I, th I believe you address that or look into that. Yes, I think that, uh, that in order to help me answer that riddle, which is how could people who I knew who were well-intentioned and smart and uh, love this country um, participate in decisions that led to such grievous consequences. And it forced me to really think very deeply um, and get beyond the stereotype of um, hubris, and arrogance, and ignorance, which is a part of the story, but it's not the deeper part of the story. Uh, it's an attractive way of understanding and explaining that story, but I don't think it really comes to terms with that other dimension of their character, which I knew because I got to work with them very closely, which is that they were smart, they did mean well, so they were intensely patriotic, and yet they made decisions that damaged this country tremendously, and that is a powerful paradox. It cannot simply be explained by hubris and ignorance. Mm -hmm. And that's why I looked at the issue of uh, cognitive ability and how that affects decision making. Um, there's been a lot of social scientific research conducted in the last 20 to 30 years that addresses this issue of the cognitive constraints that undermine objective assess assessments of reality. Uh, that the harder the problems are, oftentimes the more binding these cognitive constraints become. And those constraints apply to very bright people as much as they do to uh, you and me. And uh, when you grasp that point, it helps you understand how these kinds of decisions could be made. It helps explain that paradox. So I would think that um, a lot of people uh, might take, um, might look at the decision making in, in two other ways, which have probably been examined a lot, which is one, they might not have had all the information they needed, and two, um, that they were perhaps acting for the sake of politics. So I'm curious if you could address that. Well, uh, I think the first is certainly true. Uh, and to the degree, the second is applicable in the sense that they were all uh, aware of political pressures and at least the president has to factor um, political pressures into the equation when it comes to making decisions. Because at a fundamental level, every decision that's made by a president if it's going to endure, it has to have public support. Mm -hmm. And that is at some acid level uh, a political dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I mean that not in a negative way, but in a factual way. And I think that when you study the story of Vietnam decision making, um, again, it's a train wreck. You can see um, all the things that were done wrong, all the misjudgments that were made, all the assumptions that were questioned. Um, and that does help you understand and explain these errors. But the reality is that the process of decision-making then and now is fundamentally the same, which is you have very busy people confronting a constellation of problems day in and day out, and they're trying to cope with um, how to react to them in an intelligent and, use, and responsible way. Almost always they're doing so with incomplete information against a rapidly ticking clock. And I think it's in that kind of dynamic where what social scientists refer to as heuristics, which are simplifying rules of thumb that people will use to make sense of the world when they have to uh, make decisions in that world. Um, heuristics, those rules of thumb, when applied in complex and stressful conditions, can produce flawed decisions. And that's a significant insight um, of uh, psychology, cognitive science, and behavioral economics um, that is been shared um, with all of us in the last 20 or 30 years, and I, I understood how that would apply and help explain um, this strategy. So I think, what, so adding on to what you said, I think a lot of people who don't, who haven't worked, say, in the White House or the Pentagon, um, 
maybe don't have a clear idea of how complex um, decision making can be in those two places. Do you think, do you think anyone who hasn't experienced that can be taught to understand the complexity? Cause I think a lot of people think, well, you're the president. You just, you, you say what you want and, and it's done, or you're the secretary of defense. You say it and it's done. So, well, that's a very penetrating question, Chris. And I would like to think the answer is yes, that if you read a book like my book, Road to Disaster, it helps you understand the dynamics that afflict decision-making at the highest level. It is not a, a low-stress, uh, low-stakes environment, the high-stress, high-stakes environment, where they're making decisions with immense consequences, uh, particularly in terms of how it affects the lives of other people. And they're almost always doing that, as I said, uh, with incomplete information um, under the pressure of time. And that is not the best circumstance in which to make uh, consequential decisions. I frankly don't know that there is any other reality. That's the way Washington works at the highest level. It's a sobering, a deeply sobering fact. And I think most of those who have um, served this country at the very highest level uh, are the only ones who can really grasp that point. Um, and you hear that expressed often this way, which is presidents, once they've left office, will often remark on the, um, the contrast between the power that they assumed they would have when they became president uh, and the very limited power that they actually had to wield while they were president. Lincoln's comment is a famous one during the Civil War, I'm paraphrasing him now, but essentially what he said was, I did not control events, events controlled me. And that um, is a recurrent theme of decision-making at the highest level, particularly when you're dealing with issues of war peace. So what is so sobering about that is um, the consequences of bad uh, judgments. In other words, you mean well, and yet because you don't have all the information that you should, because you don't question your assumptions, because you're stuck in a mode of short-term rather than long-term thinking, you can make decisions that, were well-intentioned, but can have grievously damaging consequences. Mm -hmm. And I, frankly, I, I teach at the Naval Academy, and I tell the midshipmen over and over again, in all honesty, I don't see why anyone would seek to have a job like that with those responsibilities, because mm -hmm. it's so uh, demanding, um, and the parameters in which they operate um, are so harsh. Um, I would run from it rather than try to seek it. Mm -hmm. Of course, someone needs to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the jobs themselves, being Secretary of Defense, being Secretary of State, being President of the United States, frankly, are a hell of a lot harder uh, than people could ever imagine until they actually have them. Mm -hmm. So, considering what you said about the complexity and, you know, the time pressures, do, does McNamara's emphasis on sort of the operations research idea, I don't know if they called it that then, but... Um, mm -hmm. Was that a way of maybe uh, simplifying is perhaps the wrong word, but simplifying or streamlining the process of war making to make it more manageable for the the decision maker? Well, McNamara had been trained in um, quantitative analysis um, at the Harvard Business School in the late 30s. He had practiced that as an Army Air Corps officer in World War II. Um, he used that to maximize the efficiency of bombing operations against the cities of both uh, Germany and Japan. And I think he had come to rely on quantitative analysis as a way of ordering information and making sense of it and measuring the best or the lack thereof uh, in terms of specific policies. And that was, there was this, there was an approach to problem solving. Um, that he was good at, that he was familiar with, and that he therefore applied because it was something that was, as I said before, familiar to him. The problem with that was, well, there are many problems. Um, he didn't know it at the time, and we didn't know it at the time, but a lot of the data that he was being fed by the South Vietnamese, particularly during Kennedy's presidency before the assassination of Zien, was made up. And if, the, uh, if it's garbage in, I guarantee you it's going to be garbage out. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can ask yourself, well, why was he more rigorous in questioning the 
information that's being passed along to the defense department. I think part of the answer is that they wanted to believe um, what they were being given because it seemed to confirm progress. Their cultural ignorance of the Vietnamese was substantial. Um, and whenever someone um, tells you something you want to hear, the inclination is not to question it. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, the other problem with Vietnam, uh, particularly in war in general, is that in some respects you can measure war quantitatively, but there are a lot of dimensions of war that have nothing whatsoever to do with numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, the, uh, the fighting spirit of your adversary, you can't quantify that. Uh, the willingness of an adversary to absorb punishment on a uh, an unimaginable scale, that cannot be quantified. Their political passion and commitment cannot be quantified. The, um, the, the violence of war and the human suffering that comes with it um, is unquantifiable, yet crucially important. And I think that that back to mirror over time, uh, had to come to terms with that non-quantifiable dimension of war, and I think it shook him deeply. Mm-hmm. Because it, it, taught, it essentially taught him uh, that it, war is not uh, always susceptible to reason. Mm-hmm. In fact, most people who actually experience war uh, know that intuitively. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the famous comment is the only thing you control in war is the first shot. After that, it's the iron law of unanticipated and unexpected consequences mm-hmm. uh, that rule. And that's a sobering thing for people who like to think that uh, reason um, is the way to understand every element of the war, and it's not, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So, going back to how the book is um, laid out, so it is chronological, and I notice some chapters um, cover maybe a year, some are almost, or two years, you know, how, how did you break out the chapters? You know, what important thing made a particular date range? Um, you know, why would you study a particular date range? Well, what I was trying to do is identify important turning points um, in that eight-year period of the Kennedy Johnson administration. Um, and then once I identified these segments uh, that were enclosed within the bookends of turning points, um, I, I needed to understand and explain to readers what the key themes were um, that characterized the environment, the atmosphere, and the decision-making during those periods of time. And that's why each chapter um, is titled in the way that it is. For example, um, Chapter 3, which is the first chapter that turns directly to Vietnam, um, covers the background to the story uh, and decision-making by the Kennedy administration through the coup that uh, toppled and killed the end and was shortly thereafter followed by Kennedy's own assassination. And one of the pretty predominant dynamics during that period of the Kennedy administration's decision-making on Vietnam, particularly in the summer and fall of 1963 leading up to the coup against the end, was that they did not think through the consequences uh, of removing the end. They focused on his shortcomings and tried to pressure him to mend his ways. And when they sensed that he would not or could not, then they implicitly gave the green light to the generals uh, to get rid of him. But they didn't think through what the consequences would be. And there was there were warnings that were made by uh, some advisors, but Kennedy never really uh, pondered. Uh, that side of the question, because he, he was so preoccupied with fixing the immediate problem that he didn't pay attention to the long-term consequences of a short-term fix. And I think that's a very human tendency. And of course, the great irony is Kennedy had an intuitive opposition to committing American military forces to that war. Because he had experienced the war, he understood the political dynamics of Vietnam as well as any politician of his generation. But the unintended consequence of getting rid of CM was to create pressure on the United States to intervene militarily because the political situation there fell through the floor after CM was assassinated. So the, the, the painful irony is that uh, one unintended consequence, one unanticipated consequence of getting rid of CM was to generate pressure uh, for exactly what Kennedy had sought to avoid, which was the commitment of American forces. He's dead three weeks after Jim's own death, and Johnson has to cope with the consequences of this vacuum that's created politically in South Vietnam by the removal of Zim. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how that's how I would. 
approach the book in terms of structure and framework. So considering what you just said, what if someone were to um, suggest, well, you know, then the kind of leaders we need are leaders who don't think they know it all and surround themselves with advisors who give them alternative um, outcomes that might result and, and advisors who will make them think about future consequences. Yes. Well, I, I agree with you, Chris. I think that in an ideal world, that would be highly desirable. Mm -hmm. The sober reality is in the, the world as it is, particularly the political culture of Washington, it's full of smart, ambitious people who think that they know it all mm -hmm. um, or don't need experts or don't need to second-guess their assumptions. And I'm being a little bit hyperbolic, but I think you take my point. levels of decision making in that world of Washington tends to be inhabited by people who uh, do not suffer from a lack of self-confidence. And I think in a, in a fundamental sense, it's a willingness to, uh, to be self-aware and to self-reflect, um, to step outside of yourself and to ask yourself, what do I really know? What do I really understand? What do I really control? That's the surest way of mitigating the dangers of these cognitive constraints. Mm -hmm. The only problem is that atmosphere doesn't encourage that kind of self-awareness and self-reflection. Mm -hmm. The pressure of decision-making doesn't either. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to note that uh, you start with the Cuban Missile Crisis, or, or at least that's one of the early events that you discuss. And being a book on Vietnam, I didn't expect that, and it was pleasant to see. So um, yes. I'm just curious well, if you... Yeah, go ahead, touch on that. That's the question, Chris, and several people have asked me about that. And the reason is a very deliberate one, which is I don't think you can really understand the atmosphere of decision-making in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, and in particular the relationship between the civilian leadership and the military leadership during the Vietnam War without understanding the preconditions or the atmosphere that was created early on during the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. For example, uh, during the Bay of Pigs, um, Kennedy asked the Joint Chiefs to review the CIA's plan. They reviewed it and they told him that it had a, quote, fair chance, unquote, of working. Now, Kennedy, being inexperienced uh, and um, wish one is thinking, uh, elected at that. Um, they, what they didn't tell him, though, was their definition of fair chance was 30%. <laughs> and, and I think that what Kennedy learned was that oftentimes the, what you need to worry about is what they don't tell you rather than what they do. Mm -hmm. And there was an element of what I would call skirting the line of insubordination on the part of the senior military leadership during the Bay of Pigs. Kennedy had made it clear uh, both to the Cuban exile brigade privately and publicly to the American people that he would not use American military forces in Cuba. And when push came to shove and the invasion was failing, uh, the military came back at him really hard, in essence, pressuring him to use the U.S. military to try to save the situation. He told them again and again, the answer is no, and they wouldn't take no for an answer. And uh, I think that Kennedy, um, he, he lost faith in the judgment uh, of the senior military as a result of those kinds of things. And that was repeated uh, even more intensively during the missile crisis. For example, during the missile crisis, the uh, Air Force Chief of Staff, Curtis LeMay, and the Chief of Naval Operations, George Anderson, both aggressively lobbied Kennedy to attack Cuba militarily during the missile crisis, saying that war with the communists was inevitable, it's better to have it out now. And Kennedy was appalled at that advice. He was trying to show American resolve without triggering the war with the Soviet Union that could lead to a thermonuclear exchange. And I think that further eroded his confidence in the judgment of the senior military leadership. And the point I'm trying to make to you is that's the background mm -hmm. against which uh, decision-making on the Vietnam War is going to be made. And by that I mean that Kennedy and later Johnson and McNamara and a lot of other senior civilians um, really questioned the, the, the wisdom and judgment of the senior military leadership and it made them therefore very reluctant to accept their advice at face value. And it made them reluctant to share with the senior military what their own concerns were about the way American uh, war fighting was being prosecuted in Vietnam. And the reverse is also true. I think that for a lot of senior military officers, 
they um, they had nothing but disdain and disgust for what they considered to be the spinelessness of the political leadership, and so it made them um, unwilling to uh, share their fears and apprehensions with civilian leadership. And the takeaway point is, during the war, the civilian leadership and the military leadership were not really being utterly and totally candid with each other mm-hmm. about what their concerns were. And that is not a recipe for good decision-making during the war. Right. So let me ask about the resources you used um, for your research. You already discussed um, some of them. Can you expand on what you used um, to come to your conclusions? Yes. The Kennedy John Johnson Presidential Libraries uh, over the last 20 years um, have done a remarkably admirable job of making available to the American people uh, the vast majority of records uh, relating to decision-making on uh, Vietnam. And in the last 10 years in particular, some of the uh, richest material, which were uh, recordings uh, conducted by Kennedy and Johnson, have now been made available in totality. And they're important because, for example, when the Pentagon Papers were compiled, uh, the people who compiled those papers had zero access to those presidential recordings. And frankly, what the Pentagon Papers often reflect are uh, a lot of memorandums being shared at the second and third level by people. So that makes influence the process, but that's not the level of decision-making that's decisive. Mm-hmm. And it's the availability of those recordings um, in the last 10 years that have really, I think, closed the circle in terms of understanding the dynamics of decision-making. In Kennedy's case, he recorded meetings, a lot of them, almost all of them, on uh, the critical Vietnam uh, decisions of the summer and fall of 1963. And it's utterly fascinating to listen to that exchange uh, of opinions and viewpoints. Mm -hmm. A lot of those recordings have not been transcribed or published as transcriptions. Therefore, what you have to do is you have to listen to the tapes. And luckily, having met and known many of these gentlemen, uh, it was easier for me to to understand who was speaking. And uh, it really gives you a sense of uh, immediacy and texture, which is invaluable. Uh, In Johnson's case, he tended to record phone conversations, but he'd made a lot of decisions uh, over the phone. Um, And it helped you really understand the way his mind is working, what pressures he's dealing with, and why he's making the decisions that he is. So utilizing that material, which is very rich, was an important part of this book. Most historians have not really been able to incorporate that into their scholarship because those residential recordings have only been completely released in the last several years. In addition to that, um, helping Clifford and McNamara with their memoirs, I conducted extensive interviews with both of them. Uh, those interviews were taped, uh, transcripts were prepared, uh, and they run to um, many, many hundreds of pages, far more than a thousand pages. And I, I held on to those transcripts and reviewed them over the years and reflected on them, and um, thanks to the generosity of Clifford's family and Maxwell's family, I was allowed unfettered access to them and use of them and quoting them in the book. And I do think that's uh, another uh, important dimension uh, of this book, which is uh, it adds to uh, the record, it adds to the scholarly universe of, of facts, and I think that's very useful. Were you, um, and I know these, the people involved would be... Uh very old now, but were you able to interview any other people um, for this research? Yes. Well, uh, I had, during the process of my PhD dissertation research back as far back now as the mid to late 1980s, mm-hmm. uh, I had conducted uh, personal interviews with uh, several of what now Jim Houser referred to as the best and the brightest, mm-hmm. uh, and was able to utilize those interviews, but this, almost all of those principles, I can think without exception, now have passed away. But, um, for example, I traveled to Athens, Georgia, and interviewed Dean Rusk in 1988 mm-hmm. um, and was able to put questions to him, uh, which he answered with an extraordinary degree of frankness and uh, been able to utilize them in the book. Um, but George Bundy was uh, interviewed uh, repeatedly in the process of the preparation of McNamara's memoirs, and I was able to tap those interviews. And what's useful about this, those interviews is that they were eyewitnesses to history. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, they have their own point of view, they have their own agendas, they have their 
own limitations as all of us do, but it, it is an invaluable um, extra dimension to writing history when you can actually uh, question, interrogate, and cross-examine people who lived these decisions. Now, after you're um, given an introduction and, and they agree to uh, speak with you, what techniques do you use to sort of make them feel more comfortable and draw out the best information possible as you're speaking with them? I think it's a combination of two things, Chris. One is um, they understood that I was a theory scholar um, who was really seeking answers to questions rather than grinding an axe or uh, pushing an agenda. Uh, Vietnam was a very controversial subject even today, and I think they were sensitive about that, and it made them oftentimes reluctant uh, to be interviewed at length by people because they did not want to be subjected to an harangue or a speech. Mm-hmm. And they knew that uh, I was a serious scholar, and what I did in addition to that was I simply asked them open-ended questions and then shut my mouth. Mm-hmm. The thing about interviews is that you're going to get a lot more information at someone when you pose an open-ended question to them and then shut up. Because if you allow them to, uh, to speak, uh, they'll take the directions which you might not have anticipated and provide you insights and information that you might never have thought of asking. And people ultimately, I think, are, are willing to share more with you if they don't feel like they're being confronted or um, subjected to an inquisition but letting them have their say. And it can be very revealing um, when you let someone speak at length. So considering their high level, do you um, do you go in thinking, okay, there will be one interview and that's it? Or do you, at, at the end, do you ask, hey, can, can we speak again sometime? You know, how, how do you manage that that progress? Well, I think it's just true for a lot of human relationships. It's the question of building trust. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started interviewing McNamara, when I embarked on a biography, he was very guarded about talking to me. Um, he made it abundantly clear that he would discuss everything but Vietnam with me. Um, and of course I was frustrated and disappointed, but I accepted that and I said, I'm not going to, he's leaving the door open crack by continuing to talk to me. Mm-hmm. I think over time, as he began to understand that uh, I was posing tough questions to him, but I was not doing it in a highly confrontational or judgmental way, mm-hmm. um, he, was, he became more comfortable, relaxed, and willing to speak very candidly with me. And I eventually realized, as I said before, um, he's, he's a breed of uh, man who is big and not small. He's not petty or wasn't petty in the sense that he was he respected people um, who told him the truth, even if it's painful, mm-hmm. or would um, pose questions that might be critical. Um, it takes a special kind of person to um, agree to that kind of a uh, advance. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to name names, but Washington today is led by uh, many political figures of both parties uh, who I think um, are not big enough to um, absorb uh, honest criticism and uh, questioning from people. And it's, it's, it's a limitation. It's not a strength. It's a limitation. Were there documents you wanted to access that were um, perhaps classified or not available yet that you needed to put FOIA requests in or, or make a special request to get access to? Yes, but I think that, that was true more in the past than today because so many years have passed now since the Vietnam War mm-hmm. that the uh, process of declassification has been very systematic and very thorough. There's very little left now. Neither Kennedy or Johnson Residential Libraries that are still closed to researchers. The things that remain tend to be highly specific um, documents, memoranda. Often, for example, it had to do with intelligence sources and methods. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to affect the story in any significant way, but the CIA uh, keeps that information secret for reasons that I accept. Mm-hmm. Um, the other point I would make, and this is an important point, which is. Uh, American political culture is open, and uh, the failure of the United States to Vietnam is an open book. And one of the things I was respected, admired the most about our system of government is um, that we, the people, have a commitment to uh, open access to records of decision making, even of uh, dramatically failed enterprises like. American decision making on the Vietnam War and I think that said something very good about us and our system. Mm-hmm. And I would note here um, that one of the 
one of the major frustrations and limitations to uh, scholarship is the continued reluctance of the Vietnamese to make their records of decision-making during the war open to anywhere near the degree that the United States government has. Mm -hmm. What part of the research, and I know it's covered many decades, in fact, what part of it um, has been the most enjoyable or was the most enjoyable? I think the sense of discovery. Um, and I have to note here, too, that when you do research on Vietnam, it is a profoundly saddening and depressing endeavor. Um, it's it's one of the reasons, frankly, why I didn't uh, write on that subject for more than 20 years after McNamara published his book. Uh, in part, it's just an extraordinarily depressing subject. And if you're really going to uh, reflect on it, deeply, um, it just, it saddens you. And um, I, as a historian and scholar, um, you have to deal with that. That's part of the territory. But it's not a happy story. It's not, therefore, the subject that motivates you to conduct research out of a sense of wonder or um, exhilaration. You just, you have to go to a pretty dark place um, in order to do your research on that subject. What did you find that was most surprising in this research? I think, on a personal level, so getting to know several of the, those who are referred to as the best and the brightest, um, getting to know them well enough and intimately enough to recognize that uh, at the end of the day, they're also human beings like all of us. Um, just because they had a lot of responsibility, will and power, um, and were very smart, did not make them immune from all the frailties and vulnerabilities that you and I um, deal with in terms of understanding the world and making decisions. They were just as susceptible to unmet perception, failing to question assumptions, wishful thinking, short term thinking, um, denial, the tendency to double down. Uh, when you're facing a difficult situation. They, they're just people. And I think that really internalizing that insight um, is important because it, it helps to understand the mistakes. It doesn't excuse them, but it helps you understand them because you realize that a lot of their processing mistakes are our processing mistakes. Mm -hmm. And the lesson that we learn from that is just incredibly important and powerful. Um, for example, when I teach this, at the Naval Academy uh, on this subject, one of the things I drive home to my students is it's not the story of bad people making bad decisions. It's the much more sobering story of good people making bad decisions. Mm -hmm. um, the road to disaster is indeed paved with good intentions. And the reason I drive that point home to them is, and you can see where I'm going with this, those midshipmen uh, are, in a sense, the best and brightest of their generation. Mm -hmm. They, too, are very smart. They, too, are very patriotic. They, too, are very well-intentioned. And they, too, are just as vulnerable to making grievous misjudgments as that generation was. And I want them to grasp that and to internalize that, mm -hmm. not to protect them from making bad judgments in the future, but it's, it's the best insurance policy that I can think of. It doesn't eliminate risk, but it mitigates it. One thing you mentioned, um, in the post 9-11 world, you know, we're used to a lot of security around um, political figures. So th there were three events that I saw in the introduction that really kind of shocked me. One was the self-immolation uh, below McNamara's office. Um, then the crowds attacking him. I forget which university. And Harvard. then H Harvard. And then the, uh, at the, Martha, the, the, boat ramp or boat dock in Martha's Vineyard, I think, where the, the individual attacked McNamara, physically attacked him. Yes. It, it seems shocking that um, with all this strong emotion back then, that you could still have sort of relaxed security, for lack mm -hmm. of a better phrase. Um, mm -hmm. It's a different world, Chris. Um, I reflect on that myself. Um, in some ways, it's extraordinary that People like Mac Mara became the iconic symbol of this war and all the emotions surrounding it were not attacked more often because he had no security. Clifford had no security during the entire time that both of them served as Secretary of Defense. It's remarkable. I remember that um, I think Clifford told me the only security he had was his chauffeur 
carried a pistol. Hmm. That was it. Um, and this is during the era, remember, when civil protests in this country were so intense that they deployed the National Guard in Washington, D.C., and placed machine guns uh, atop the steps of the Capitol mm-hmm. out of fear of uh, the potentiality of civil war. Um, now, that they ran greater personal risks as a result of that, but I also think one advantage was they were closer to ordinary people. Uh, emotionally, psychologically, they weren't in a bubble to the degree that a lot of decision makers are today. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's no way that that's healthy because being in a bubble just reinforces that sense of being special, mm-hmm. um, which is so toxic to being grounded in a sense of being self aware and self critical. Yeah, it does seem like leadership um, over the decades has been become more strange from the uh, the voting public. Um, yep. And that's, I don't think in the long run that's healthy. I mean, there are risks inherent in being closer to people, mm-hmm. but there are huge advantages as well. Because you understand, you can read the pulse of the American people better when you're moving among them rather than when you're in a bubble. Mm-hmm. Was there a particular issue that was um, very difficult to come to a conclusion on, or maybe you feel you, you haven't really come to a conclusion that you're happy with? Really hard question to answer, Chris. Um, I know there's a lot to I, choose from. <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, I guess for me, my greatest frustration is that I wasn't able to sit down and have uh, lengthy conversations with all of the principal decision makers. I was lucky enough to have exposure to a lot of them. But for example, um, Robert McNamara was probably closer to John F. Kennedy than anyone else in that administration with the exception of his brother. So in a sense, I was as, I got as close to understanding the mind of John F. Kennedy as I could by getting to know Robert McNamara well. But that's no substitute for actually having, having met Kennedy or interviewed him. Of course, I was three years old when he was assassinated, so that's a possibility. Um, Clark Clifford um, was probably as close to Johnson as anyone outside of his family. And in that sense, I was able to get close to his mind in the way it worked through Clifford. But also, um, I was 13 years old when Lyndon Johnson passed away. It would have been it, it would have been immensely helpful to be able to pick um, their brains. But of course, you know, I can't get into the time machine to do that. Mm-hmm. Was there? And you you mentioned how how difficult and sad, you know, sort of depressing researching this subject is. But was there anything? that was particularly um, emotionally moving for you, and that could be either negatively or even something positive that you discovered? Oh, I think it's both. Um, the, the pain and suffering caused by the war. Um, I've seen that uh, on the faces of many, many people, uh, on the faces of uh, Vietnam veterans, mm-hmm. on the faces of uh, Vietnamese uh, refugees, on the face of Robert Maxwell. Um, everyone involved in that war suffered in one way or another. Um, and when you see that, when you witness that, it's a very sobering thing. Uh, and it just drives home uh, the human consequences of war. And it just, uh, as I point out in the prologue, um, you know, I teach at the Naval Academy, but uh, to me, war is a, a pretty damn stupid way of solving differences between creatures who have the capacity to reason. Mm-hmm. Just the, the, the damage that can be done on the human level of the war is just um, incalculable. Oh, yeah. And it's enduring. I, you know, people will never get over that suffering. I used to not understand that, and now I do. The older I've gotten, the more I realize that if you were wounded psychologically, physically, or emotionally by the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. you're going to be wounded for your, the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and asking someone to get over that or put that behind them is asking more than a human being can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Um, what do you hope then um, the book will do? I hope it will help people understand how and why the decisions were made. That, that they were made by human beings, not by monsters. Uh, or by automatons, um, because I think it enables you and me and others to see in those decision makers. Um, and it's great that you can place yourself in their shoes and say to yourself, oh my God, there for the grace of God go I. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a powerful thing. Um, and I, I want today's decision makers to read that book. I want tomorrow's decision makers to read that book. I want people 
people who wield power today and will wield power in the future um, to internalize their example. Because the, the, the bottom line truth is the best and the brightest were, in fact, the best and the brightest that have ever served the American people. Mm-hmm. And they made serious errors of judgment. And if the best and the brightest can do that, all of us can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I definitely hope that uh, decision makers today and in the future will read the book um, because it is a major reality check. So what's your next writing project? I don't know, Chris. I'm sort of in a recovery mode right now. It's very taxing for me emotionally, psychologically to deal with this subject. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just need to um, put it aside, um, reflect, um, and then when the moment is right, um, get back up in the saddle and start doing research and writing again. Wow, Okay. So where can people find uh, the book and maybe other other writings that you've done or your thoughts, anything on social media? Um, I don't do very much social media, unfortunately, but the book, thankfully, is available uh, widely in bookstores throughout the country, um, and it's available online to purchase at uh, sites such as Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, I think even Walmart and uh, Target are carrying the book. And that's a wonderful thing, because it's not geared to an elite audience. It is geared to uh, everyone, because I think that everyone can uh, relate at a fundamental level uh, to the humanity of that story. And that is a powerful and a good thing. So I imagine um, a book like this still would, um, as McNamara's um autobiography did, you know, 20 some years ago, you know, you're going to have strong opinions. Um, do you think you'll engage much with people, even if they have, you know, emotionally based arguments, or are you going to just try to let the book speak for itself and just sit back? I think mostly the latter, but I I also respect people's, uh, opinions and, uh, their differences with each other and with me. It's okay. Um, every coin has two sides to it. I tell that to my students. Um, having a conversation in which reasonable people can disagree um, is perfectly acceptable to me, and I think that's really useful discourse in a democracy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that the uh, willingness to listen um, is of crucial importance. Um, my father once told me, he said, Brian, you learn a lot more by listening than talking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a truism, but there's a lot of wisdom to that. Yeah. Um, and and I, I like listening uh, to people and their opinions. You, I think you can learn from that. Definitely. So that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? No, I'm just uh, thankful and impressed with the quality of the questions that you put to me. Uh, they were good ones, and uh, I hope I answer them in ways that are illuminating for your listeners. Oh, I think so. Yeah, definitely. I, and thank you for that. Thank you for speaking with me. You're welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for listening. One of the best ways to provide feedback on this podcast is to rate it on iTunes. Please let me know if you liked it or give me a poor rating if you didn't like this podcast and I can use that feedback to hopefully get better. Otherwise, please follow me on Instagram at Chris Alvarez War Scholar, on YouTube under War Scholar 1945 on Twitter at War Scholar, on Facebook under War Scholar, and you can find more information on my website, warscholar.org. Please remember my name, Chris, does not have an H, so it's C-R-I-S-A-L-V-A-R-E-Z. Thank you, and I hope you continue to enjoy this podcast.